writing UCL and Berkeley. And, and recently, 2012, uh, Professor Rashford was made a um, fellow of the Royal Society, and last year was elected uh, an honorary member of the German Academy of Sciences as well, so it should be a very good name.
you just suppress infection. There's no longer infection. The bacteria is no longer able to recognize you to the receptors on the bladder cell, and therefore will not attach to the bladder. So uh, it's also an important uh, virulent factor, factors, and that's why we study it. So let me tell you, I'm going to have to spend five minutes uh, to tell you uh, first how uh, is the state of knowledge that we had when we started the, the, the work. Um, so what you have here is a schematic diagram of a, a pillars. Um, so you have to, the, the, the pillars, and this is a micrograph, uh, the pillars is made of two parts. There's a flexible part, so the part that I'm uh, trying to, to point to in my pointer here, this part is a rather flexible part, and this is what you're seeing here schematically. And then you have a thicker part here, which is extremely long, much longer than what you're seeing here. Um, and this is what the, the sign of blue part that you're seeing here. Um, so this part is called uh, the tip fibrillum or the tip, uh, while the rigid part, the thick part, is called the rod. Now, um, as you can see, there's a number of subunits that make those pillars, and each of the subunits are, are present in, a, in or is present in a different stoichiometry. Um, so let's start by the top here. You can see the red subunit here with the, the G. Um, this red subunit is the business end of the pillars. That's the one that's going to attach. So that, that's got the receptor binding domain. So it's going to be the one doing the work. That means binding to, specifically to receptors on the bladder cell or on the kidney cell. So now the pillars I'm showing you here is actually attaching to kidney cells, but, but it doesn't matter. You always have this. Uh, uh, Type of proteins here indicated in red, which we call an easy protein, and that binds specifically to receptors on the eukaryotic cell. There's only one copy of that one. Purpose. Then you have another protein, uh, which we call an adapter protein in orange, here, we're also present in just one copy. Then you have this yellow, uh, little yellow polymer. I'm going to show two of those yellow subunits, but those yellow subunits are usually five to ten of them. In, in that part of the pillars. You have then the green one, which serves as, a, as an adapter uh, between the, the, the yellow, the small yellow polymer, and the very long cyan blue polymer. So this cyan blue subunit here, there's about a thousand of them. So you have to imagine that this uh, thing is much, much uh, longer. I'm going to show you a very small portion of it. Um, and, and this is uh, the major constituent of the road. Is that thicker part. And the reason why it's a rod is because this, this subunit, the sign blue subunit, indicated in A here, with, with the letter A, uh, winds in a superhelical structure about 3.3 subunits per turn. That's why it is thick, that's what it makes a, a, this rod, this thick rod, and rigid. Um, then you get uh, on the other side of the outer membrane, um, and then you have this protein here with the letter H, and, uh, or pale green. And that's what we call the termination subunit. All, all pili uh, have at the end, or at least all pili of this type, have at the end a termin what we call a termination subunit. And you'll see what it is. Uh, this termination subunit is always bound to this uh, magenta protein here, which is a shackle. So to understand what, what the shackle is, uh, I'm going to to tell you how we get to uh, the, the, the synthesis of this uh, ribosome of those subunits and how we get to have the pillars. So as you can imagine, also subunits that you have here are produced in the cytoplasm on this side of the inner membrane. Remember, gram-negative bacteria have two membranes. I forgot to say that. But there's two membranes, an inner membrane and an outer membrane. Anyway, on this cytosolic part, uh, side of the inner membrane, uh, you have the ribosomes, of course, and, and that's where the subunits are produced. Um, they are uh, then uh, ferried through or translocated through the inner membrane here through the SEC YEG translocon. Maybe you know that SEC 61 is exactly the same. It's a very conserved uh, translocon uh, uh, complex, uh, conserved from bacteria to humans. So the, the subunits go through this translocon and get into that space here between the two membranes. That space is called the periplasm. Uh, however, the subunits have a problem, is that if they are released directly into the periplasm, they are immediately degraded, they cannot fold, uh, so they form aggregates and then are therefore uh, immediately degraded. To fold, they need a shackle. 
And the chaperone is this uh, magenta protein. So the magenta protein receives the subunit, the, 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 the pure subunits, at the exit of the sequoia EG transport cone and uh, help uh, fold uh, the subunits. <coughs> um, they remain on the subunit. Once the, fold, uh, the, the, the subunits are folded, they do uh, remain on uh, the chaperone, remains on the subunit. And um, what you have here is formation of these myriad, thousands of the chaperone subunit complexes, um, which are uh, effectively crowding uh, the plate plasmic space here. So you have the, the, the red subunit bound to a chaperone, they all bound to a chaperone, the full stable chaperone subunit complexes. Okay, so what happened next is that you have this protein in dark blue with the letter C. This is what we call the Usher. Um, the Usher protein uh, is the site of assembly of, uh, of, of, of the pillars. That's, all, that's where all the shackles of unit complexes are going to go. They're going to dock onto this outer membrane protein. It's effectively an outer membrane protein, as you can see. All shackles of unit complexes are going to go uh, bind, uh, be recruited to the Usher, and uh, this Usher is going to orchestrate the production of that, the polymerization of the, of the pure subunits, and the secretion of the pillars. Okay, so it's a polymerization analogy, it's also a secretion analogy. Okay, first you have this uh, complex here, which is the, the red subunit, uh, with its uh, bounce to its chaperone. Uh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, it's the same chaperone for each subunit, okay, so that just, just works for uh, all the subunits. Um, so, the first chaperone subunit complex to go to, to be assembled is this uh, red subunit bound to its chaperone, and that makes sense because the red subunit has to be at the top, so it has to be assembled first, it has to be recruited first by the usher. Uh, it does that, it does that because it has the highest affinity of all chaperone subunit complexes for the usher, and it's also the, the only complex that is able to activate the usher, and then I'm going to tell you more about activation in the show when I show you the structure of the usher. Anyway, this is recruited. Next, you're going to have the orange one, which remember the orange one is going to be uh, uh, next. So you have the orange subunit down to its chaperone is going to uh, come in, be recruited to the usher. The orange subunit is going to react to the red subunit, and the chaperone on the red subunit is going to be released. So that's something important. The chaperone is never part of the pillars. Okay? Then you have the yellow one, so the yellow one reacts with the orange one, the seven yellow ones will react, and um, you have the green one that comes in, and this is what you have here. Okay, you have now the green one, bound to its chaperone, has been recruited to the usher, the green one has reacted to the yellow one that has been incorporated in the previous cycle of service incorporation, and that will trigger the polymerization of the sign blue subunit. So the first one is going to come in, React with the uh, green subunit, the chaperone on the green subunit is going to go, it will be released in the plate plasma, and that will trigger the recruitment of a thousand one by one A subunits of the sign blue subunits going to come one by one, react, and the pillars is going to grow progressively out. Then finally, you have this plate green subunit here, uh, which is going to be recruited with its chaperone. The plate grain subunit is going to react with the sign subunit that's been incorporated in the previous cycle, and everything's going to stop. Okay, so that's the termination subunit. It stops polymerization. So, as you can imagine, you have to show sure, hundreds of questions. You know, why, 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 why the red line first? What determines the order of subunits? How the reaction works? How the termination works? Plenty of questions. So, we're going to go through this uh, through this talk. So the first thing that we did to try to understand the system is to crystallize uh, this chaperone subunit complex, and I'm going to show you the, that structure. Um, this recapitulates the structure of all chaperone subunit complex in any system. Okay, and we saw them all in that system. We saw some others, others, some others. Uh, we uh, we know now what what the, the chaperone subunit complex structure looked like, and this is what I'm going to show you. They all look the same. So. Sorry for the change, sorry for the change in, in color coding, but what you have in green in that particular slide, what you have in green here is the chaperone. So it's a very simple structure. It's a two-domain structure, two IG domain structures, 
uh, domain one here, domain two here. Um, now what you have here in sign blue is uh, the subject. Okay. Now the subject uh, has uh, something uh, special, which is when you do a surface diagram of that subunit, you can see this big group here. Um, okay, I mean the group doesn't make the, the protein special, but what makes it special here is the way this group is created. Because it's created through the lack of a strand. So let me explain. If you do a topology graph diagram of the subunit, I'm sure you, you all know what it is. You take the, 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 the subunit structure, you split, split it apart, you put arrows where you see strands and, and, and cylinders where you, when, when you see ellipses, and that helps us, as you know, uh, determine the topology of the, of, of the protein, and you can see that A plus subunit looks like an IG fold, okay, immunoglobin like fold. But it's missing a strand. You can see that there should be in a regular IG fold, you should, you should have additional sub, uh, sequence at the C terminus that will come out here and make a strand G. Strand G is totally missing. And that explains why the subunit without the chaperone cannot fold. An IG fold without the strand G cannot fold. Um, so what, does, what the chaperone does is that it inserts itself here between where the strand G should be, but you will notice that the, that, that strand here is going the other way. In the regular IG port, you go here to where the chaperone inserts uh, the G strand of its domain 1, um, and it does it the opposite way. Um, and I, I might or might not go back to that, but that is a fairly uh, uh, interesting aspect. But uh, so in 3D, um, you can see this G1 strand here of the chaperone. So this G strand of domain 1 is inserted into that group. So that's how the chaperone works. It works by stabilizing by inserting by donating a strand, thereby complementing the fold of the subunit, of the pillar subunit. So we call that donor strand complementation. Here we are, donor strand complementation. That's the motivation of that chaperone, that particular great plastic chaperone. Okay, so this has uh, consequences in terms of pillars assembly because remember I told you the chaperone, as the pillars is assembled, the chaperone is not part of the pillars. So at some point the pillars is going to, the chaperone is going to have to go. And I'm going to show you an animation roughly giving you what we thought the mechanism would be uh, in uh, 2002. Um, and I think it's still a good, good base at least to understand uh, pillar structure and pillar springs uh, by genesis. Um, so this is a structure that you've seen. I just would like to point to one piece that I added. Um, this piece here, which is the end terminus of the subunit, this piece was not in the structure because it's disordered. Okay, it's in the sequence, of course, but it is disordered, so we couldn't see it in the electron density. However, uh, I modeled it here because this piece of the, of, of the protein is, is essential for polymerization. It's called the end terminal extension of NTE. And that's something I'm going to tell you a lot about <laughs> in terms of extension uh, or, in terms of, uh, or NTE. This is just only 10 to 15 residues at the end terminus of the pillar subunit. And uh, it is disordered absolutely essential for polymerization. And you're going to see that now. Because in the animation, what you're going to see here is the chaperone uh, dissociating. You can clearly see the gap here due to the missing strand. And then you have another chaperone subunit complex here coming in. Subunit is in red. You can see the internal extension of that subunit in red inserting here. And then you have a gap here. The next subunit will come in and insert its internal extension in this gap. Okay? So as you can now imagine, the pyrus is made of successive IG folding uh, subunits, one here, one here, but they are complemented in trans by the internal extension of the subunit next in assembly. Okay, so you have this subunit here, you have the internal extension here of the subunit next in assembly, and so on. Okay, that's basically the pillars structure and how the pillars subunits put together in the mature pillars. Okay, so now the this um, mechanism of uh, whereby the strand of the chaperone is replaced by the end terminal extension of the subunit next in assembly, which is going to make a strand, we're going to call we, we, we call this donor strand exchange. Okay, you can see that strand, the strand of the chaperone is being replaced by the end terminal extension strand uh, 
is what is inserted on the spine. So we call that donor spine exchange. And uh, so we're going to now go into the detail of this, the medical details of this donor spine exchange, and just see how it works. You know, how come the chaperone goes and this internal extension goes in? How does it do that? Um, so we studied this with uh, Sheena Radford and uh, Alice Nashcroft in Leeds. And uh, what we decided to do is obviously to purify a chaperone subunit complex here. There's a chaperone in gray, subunit in blue here. Take another chaperone subunit complex, uh, chaperone in gray, subunit in uh, red. What is shown here is the internal extension of the subunit in red. And if you put them together in the same uh, mixture, with the same reaction, you're going to have this internal extension of that subunit going into the groove of the subunit in blue, thereby dissociating, displacing the strand of the chaperone, the chaperone dissociates. Okay? This is fundamentally the reaction that we're uh, looking uh, into. Um, we discovered very rapidly that this reaction occurs with exactly the same kinetics. Um, if you do away with the bulk of the chaperone subunit complex and only keep the stem to 15 residue internal extension. So those peptides alone, 10 to 15 residues, are able to attack a chaperone subunit complex and displace the chaperone and go into the groove of subunits. So they, they can do that and they do it with the same kinetics. Okay? But obviously it's a lot easier to then monitor that reaction and we did it using that spectrometry. So I'm going to tell you first what we discovered and then I'm going to tell you what uh, the, the results were uh, very quickly. Um, so what we discovered is that this process of exchange of strength, okay, chaperone strength going in, next to being going in, that exchange of strength occur, occurs through a zipping, zip out mechanism. What I mean by that is that the way this peptide here is able to attack this complex here is by inserting a residue at its C terminus, which we call the P5 residue. This P5 residue is able to um, to, to bind a, and insert into a pocket which we call the P5 pocket. And I'll show you in a second what this P5 pocket looks like. It's a very distinctive feature. Um, and this positions, by, by inserting this residue into this pocket here, it positions this peptide just in front of the group. That means the peptide is ready to go into the group, zips in, and at the same time the chaperone is, uh, is, is completed out. It zips out. That's why we call it the zip in, zip out. So this is what you're seeing here. You have the P5 residue, P5 pocket interaction here, and then that positions the rest of the peptide in front of the groove for groove invasion. So it's going to progressively invade this um, uh, the groove of that submit in blue, uh, allowing the uh, zipping out of the strand of the shell, and then what that, that that leads to the dissociation of the shell. Now. These are the mass spec results that we obtained with uh, Sheena and Alison. I just want to show you that we were able to capture this intermediate here. So this tertiary complex that you're seeing here is exactly the complex that you're seeing in sign blue here. So this thing here, you can see, does not exist at time zero. It appears in the, and then disappears. It's a transient intermediate. You can follow all the, 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 the reactive species. You can plot them. Uh, so, for instance, this is the chaperone subunit complex. You can just look at the pics and you can see it disappear. And you can see the chaperone appear in yellow. You can see uh, the subunits down to the peptide uh, in dark blue uh, uh, appearing. So, uh, it, it, you, can, you can really have a complete kinetic characterization of the system. I'll show you uh, uh, and, uh, what it looks like in the The P5 pocket, you can see here, it's right in front of the groove. So you can see the next subunit coming in. So the next, imagine you know, this is already in place. The next subunit comes in, and you can see the, the, this P5 residue of the air terminal extension of, the, of, 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 of this incoming subunit can fit into there, here, and then zips in inside that groove while the strand of the shell zips out. So this is this zip in, zip out mechanism. Um, I'll show you more of the kinetics in a moment, but what I would like to show you now is that it allows this, this observation that you know, this is done as an exchange, uh, reaction occurs through uh, insertion of a residue into a pocket. Um, this allows us to understand termination. 
So why did it uh, do that? Well, well, how come? Um, so I told you there's a, 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 a um, subunit, uh, this particular one, H here, uh, in pale green, that um, once um, is inserted into the pillars, has reacted with this subunit here in cyan blue, everything stops. It's a termination subunit. How come it is a subunit? I'll just show you first the biological results. Uh, showing, you know, this has all the feature, uh, phenotypic feature of the termination subunits. Uh, if you have one time, you can see the, 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 uh, the size of the pili uh, and the length, the, the average length of the, the pili of the bacterium. Uh, if you overexpress this H subunit, you can see they're much shorter. So by increasing the concentration of H within the periplasm, you shorten the pili because you have more termination events. Um, but if you delete completely this H subunit, uh, you can see that the pili are very long and detached. So Papage, it, or this H subunit, uh, is indeed a, 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 a whole, the, the hallmark of, of a termination subunit. And the reason why it is a termination subunit is because it does not have a P5 pocket. You see, all subunits that are able to polymerize have a P5 pocket. That means the next subunit can come in, insert its P5 residue, in there, and then the zip in zip out uh, reaction can occur. While here, with PAP H, once PAP H it is in the pillars, you see, there's no incoming subunits that, that can insert in there. And that's because there's no P5 And that's a unique mechanism of termination of solids. Um, and again, we have, uh, you know, I can't show you all the, the, the data, uh, but we have obviously a, a lot of results just that, you know, confirming that. Aspect of the uh, of this mechanism. Okay, so now uh, a question I often uh, have is that you know why do you have this order of assembly? You know why is that the red the the, 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 the orange subunit or F is after G, E after F, A after K, and so on. So to answer this question again, we we ganged up with uh, with Sheila Radford and, and Alison Ashford. And uh, because we had, you know, an aspect assay where we could put, you know, all the chapters of the complexes, purify them one by one, and then challenge them with all the intermediate extension of all the subunits. So you can then follow every every reactant. If, uh, you could you could follow that aspect quantity. So this is, was a really uh, important asset for us to look at the order of assembly. So we took all those uh, complexes here. Uh, uh, in, in that system, we challenge each of them uh, uh, with peptide corresponding to the end terminal extension of those uh, subunits, and uh, this is uh, an example examples of results that we get. For instance, you take this this uh, protein here. Um, this protein you see has a groove in that domain here, in which the uh, end terminal extension peptide of F of this orange subunit. Is, uh, is, 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 is logic, okay? You have this uh, group here in which you have the peptide of this subunit, okay? And so if you now take the Chapman subunit complex corresponding to that subunit and start challenging it with all the internal extension of all the other subunit, the green one, the yellow one, the orange one, and so on, the only one that reacts is the orange one. You see the one of that. Showing that this, this uh, uh, complex between uh, red subunit and chapel can only be challenged by the internal extension of uh, the subunit uh, in orange here. And sure enough, indeed, orange, uh, the, the orange is after the, 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 um, the red one. Uh, you can do that for uh, any of the chapel subunit complexes. Uh, I've summarized here uh, the, the, uh, the, the results. Um, and you can see that, for instance, PAP A, uh, which is this uh, sign uh, blue subunit, can react obviously with the internal extension of uh, another PAP A subunit, and that's why you have the polymer of PAP A. But you also have a, a reaction possible with the internal extension of PAP H, and this is how PAP H gets into the polymer by reacting to the group of PAP A of A. Okay, or the sign is the subunit here. So you can see that you know the, 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 you have. Uh, the, the reaction between the group and the peptide really recapitulate the order of assembly. The, the, so this is where the, the action is. Uh, the uh, order of assembly is, is really caused by uh, this interaction between group and peptides. 
Um, now, even more interesting, I think, is this slide here. Because what we've, what we've done here, so we've taken this, uh, this subunit, which is the, the yellow one, okay? And what we did, we've done is that we've taken the, 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 the complex between this yellow subunit and its sharp one, and then we reacted with the internal extension peptide of this subunit, either this one, the yellow one, or uh, uh, the, uh, it's not here, the H one, it should be H here. Okay, uh, so you have this yellow peptide and then you have this uh, dark blue peptide. And uh, so what you have here is recapitulated uh, by this uh, 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 curve here, so it's a rapid reaction, while with this peptide here, the reaction is slower, much slower here, okay? Now you just swap the, uh, the, the, the C-terminal uh, bits, and only uh, you know, so, so one, two, three, four, five, six, just, just the, the, the C-terminal half. You just swap them between the two peptides. And what you found is that where you see the yellow bit, so here you have the yellow bit and here the yellow bit, same kinetics. While you have the blue bits here, it's the same kinetics, the same slow kinetics. So the, the, the behavior of each peptide is recapitulated by the residues which are at the C terminus, okay, near the P5 okay. So this is what this slide uh, means uh, to say, is that the action is all in the C terminus around the P5 pocket. And we mutated each of those residues one by one. And I can tell you that the most important is actually the P5 residues. So this, this interaction, you know, when the subunit comes in, when this P5 residue interact with this P5 pocket, that's where the, 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 the specificity of the ordering occurs. And I think it's quite extraordinary that you know, just one residue, one pocket interaction is sufficient to determine that, uh, that uh, something as important as the uh, ordering of the, the subunits in the case. So it's, it's quite a uh, story, I think. Um, okay, so over the years, we've been able to um, uh, determine the, 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 um, uh, the structure of this subunit here uh, with the, uh, its receptor here on the kidney. So this, this is an is a, uh, adhesion protein which is specific of the, uh, of the receptors on the kidney. And we've been able to focusize um, uh, the kidney receptor, which is a, a, a tetrasaccharide, uh, with uh, this protein here. Uh, and that really, really recapitulates the reason why uh, bacteria that harbor that kind of pili would be targeted to the kidney. And this is the, the tropism interaction that it determines the, the infection. Um, so we want to uh, determine, obviously, the structure of, of, the, uh, of the orange subunit, of the, uh, the, the yellow one, the green one, uh, the cyan one, uh, and also, obviously, uh, the termination subunit. And we were left with, um, with the, uh, the structure of the usher. So, what, uh, so obviously this went at the end because it was a membrane protein and we had no, uh, no idea how to do that kind of stuff. So we, um, uh, we uh, uh, went on to try to crystallize at least part of this uh, uh, protein. Uh, let me recapitulate what this protein does. So it's called the Usher, so it's spelled like that. Uh, it's an outer membrane assembly platform. It's also a secretion bore. It's fairly large, about 800 amino acids, sometimes larger. And um, its domain structure uh, was roughly known. You have um, at the end terminus here uh, a domain of about 125 residues. We know this domain dangled in the beta-plasm and is the first to capture shackle sodium complexes. So you have to imagine it, you know, it's floating in there and then picking up shackle sodium complexes. That's the first port of entry for shackle sodium complexes. Um, then you have a large transformation domain here, about 500 residues, and then you have this C-term domain which we knew not much about. Um, structurally, uh, what was known is the structure of this internal domain bound to a shackle subunit complex. So we knew how this domain uh, uh, was able to recruit shackle subunit complexes, and this is what you're seeing here. In dark blue, you have this internal domain bound to a shackle in yellow, uh, and, and subunits in green. And that was the work from Nishiyama et al., which I published in 2005, uh, a group in the ETH. It was not our, our, our work. What we did when we entered that particular uh, aspect of the work 
is that we um, crystallized the translocation domain. So we, we uh, cloned it out, we, uh, we expressed it, we purified all the nitrogen membrane and detergents, and crystallized it. And so that's a structure that we got, because um, that's a translocation domain. It turned out to be a, a huge beta band, about 24 strands, so still the, the, the biggest beta band known. And uh, it has, uh, in the middle of here, a, a plug, uh, which is a folded domain within the sequence of the, of the beta band uh, that obstructs uh, 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 the, uh, the, the lumen of the, of the beta band. So obviously, uh, the lumen, uh, this uh, part here is, a, is closed. But here you have a, a plug in there. And, and that part is going to have to come out at some point to get the policy. Um, so uh, that structure certainly uh, was instructed, but didn't tell us uh, how the usher works. To understand how the usher works, we have to crystallize the usher, the full next usher, with a chaperone submarine complex biotype. Okay, and so we uh, to do that, we turn to a system which is a little uh, more simple, which is the one you're seeing here. Most of what I've told you about um, has been about this. Uh, these PPIs, I told you about these A, K, E, F, G subunits, which are really the PAC subunits of the pink pillars, which is the pillars that targets uh, E. coli to the, to the kidney epithelium. Uh, the one that targets E. coli to the bladder is this type 1 pillar system, and that is um, a, a more simplified system in the sense that it has a tip structure that, uh, here, it has a tip structure which is made of three subunits only, and each we turned to this uh, uh, system here, and what we did is that we uh, uh, co-expressed, um, uh, so in that system, the usher is called uh, fin D, uh, and then the uh, subunit that we uh, uh, did co-crystallize is the fin H subunit, the tip one, uh, together with chaperone, which is called fin C. So you have the usher, a chaperone, and a subunit. Um, so we were able to get crystals of this. We were able, obviously, to purify uh, the, 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 the usher together with the chaperone subunit complex by removing a bit of the N-terminus, about uh, five to ten residues, and making a single cut uh, on one of the looms of the pore. We were able to get crystals. And so the, the, this is the mass spectrometry of what we purified, showing that it's a one-one-one complex. Um, we also, what we did is that before we we uh, solve that structure, we thought to demonstrate that this complex is active. And what we mean by active is that it is pure <coughs> and in detergent. If you provide the next chaperone subunit complex, are you going to have the strand exchange? How are you, are you going to have a growing uh, pillars? And so what, that's what we did. We took the, took the ternary complex, the complex I just showed you. We uh, provided the next subunit assembly, which in that system is called FIMG. We fluorescently labeled FIMG, purified CG, labeled FIMG, and then put it together with that. And what we would expect is that this subunit here to react with this one. So, right, you have FIMG, which is in the downstream change with this subunit in green. You would have this reacting with that. And this should be apparent on the gel because of the, the interaction between subunits is resistant uh, to heat. Uh, Sorry, is resistant to SDS, provided that you don't eat. Okay, you don't want. So you can see here on the channel the, uh, the, 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 the two subunits uh, complex appearing here and growing in intensity. You can, uh, it's fluorescent, so it's a fluorescent gel. And uh, you can plot then uh, the division <coughs> of the reaction and show that uh, after about 30 minutes uh, the reaction is completed. So what we have purified was indeed an active usher. An usher that in its pure form could assemble the pillars. You could take a subunit, take another one, another one, and make a pillar. Uh, so we, um, we uh, determined the structure of that, and this is what you're seeing here. Um, so the usher, uh, the full axis usher now, uh, or almost full axis, it's only five to 10 minutes you're missing at the very end terminus, which is the very end terminus around uh, what it is, but it's, 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 it's hidden actually. Um, so, um, in a ribbon diagram is the usher, okay? The subunit uh, is in uh, green, and then the, the chapel is in yellow. So, let's start with the N terminus. This is the N terminal domain that you're seeing here, 
Okay? Uh, what you're seeing here is the, the, the 24 strand embedded barrier. Uh, remember that in the structure that I showed you, there was a, a plug in it. Uh, as you can see, the plug is now, which is shown here, this plug is now out. And instead, you have a, uh, one of the domains of the, uh, of, of the subunit is inserted inside that better ground. Now, um, remember that uh, we thought that the, end, the, the sharpen subunit complexes would be bound to the internal domain. Right? The internal domain is here. I showed you the internal domain. I told you the internal domain is the primary, primary recruiter of sharpen subunit complexes. So we were expecting the sharpen subunit to, uh, complex to be bound to this here. Instead, we saw it down to those two C terminal domains. So I come down to the C terminal domains. You can see there's two domains here, CTD1 and CTD2, to which the chaperone the here and the subunit are bound to. Okay? So I uh, just want to just rotate this uh, just to show you that, um, that, that I think this is still an extraordinary view of a, of a protein inside, a polyprotein inside a protein. Um, which is something that we've never seen before. It's, um, so, our um, uh, structure reveals a second Chapel subunit complex binding site. We knew there was one here, and remember I showed you that structure of, uh, that was sold, sold at the ETH, um, of the internal bound, the domain bound to a Chapel subunit complex. Uh, as I told you, we don't see uh, the Chapel subunit down here, we see down here at the C terminus. Okay, so that means we have two sites that are able to bind Chapel subunit complexes. And the question is now, how do they work together? Okay, so to, uh, to work this out, what we did is that we took the ETH structure with the internal domain here, bound to Chapel subunit, and then we take our structure and we superimpose the two. The internal domain that you're seeing here is exactly the same as you see here. So it's very easy to superimpose. And if you do that, this is what you get. Obviously, change now the color coding of that subunit. It was green here, now it's orange. And what you can see here is that if you just put that structure onto this one, the subunit that you see in orange here is not clashing with the subunit in green, which means that the end term of domain here is actually free to bind the next Chapel subunit complex in assembly. Okay? Moreover, if you now zoom in, onto that interface here, what you found is what you're finding here. So I changed the, the, the obviously the representation of that uh, structure, it's now in a ribbon. But you can see that the internal extension of that subunit in orange is now right over the P5 pocket uh, here of the subunit in green here. That means those two subunits here are ready to undergo the strand exchange, they're ready to find them. Right? And so in our uh, model, the um, uh, the, 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 um, in our structure here, we have an internal domain here, which is ready to bind the next Chapel subunit complex in assembly. It positions now the internal extension of the subunit just recruited, just next to the P5 pocket of the subunit that being recruited uh, before it, so the green one. That allows the strand exchange to occur, so we have strand invasion. Okay, the internal extension of that subunit invades the group of the subunit in green, leading to the dissociation of, uh, of the shackling on the subunit in green. Now, the C-terminal domains are uh, vacated, they're liberated, they're free, and everything's going to move there. And I'll show you evidence of that in a second. So, um, that frees up the internal domain uh, now for the recruitment of the next shackling subunit complex in assembly. So, this is what you get now. Subunit in red. Is now ready to uh, to to do a uh, double strand exchange with the subunit in orange, and uh, so strand invasion occurs. The uh, shackle that was on the orange subunit is free. Now you have again. So you're just seeing the, the, what I mean here. Uh, those domains are free now to uh, to welcome or to to receive uh, the uh, the pairs, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's now the next subunit. Uh, here we are. So now what I would like to do, and I'll come back to this uh, uh, also in about five to ten minutes, um, I would like to, uh, there's a transfer from this internal domain to the C terminal domain, right? It's time you, um, so, the, uh, so you have a transfer from, uh, from here to here. And you would think, you know, how does that 
work. You have to have that, you know, do we have any evidence for that? Well, we do, and I'm going to show you that now. So this transfer of reaction from the internal domain to the C-terminal domain arises from the fact that on the chaperone, the surfaces involved in interactions with either the internal domain or the C-terminal domain are the same. Okay? So if you look at our, uh, the structure of the internal domain down to the chaperone surface complex, if you can see the surfaces here are involved in the yellow surfaces are involved in interactions with the internal domain. If you look at our complex with the chaperone submitted down to the CTDs, you can see that surface is the same. So that means those two things should be able to compete with each other. Okay? And this is exactly what we demonstrated here. If you take the internal domain down to a chaperone submit complex, so here is the internal domain of the uh, Asher down to a chaperone submit complex. And what you do here is that to that mixture, you just add CTD2. So this domain alone. Okay? We couldn't do it with the entire CTM domain because it was not stable. But if you just do it with the CTD2, um, you can see you just add to the mixture the CTD2 here. And what you found here in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the flow through, you will find the chaperone subunit complexes, and this is, you see, no longer down to the end of the end. So they're able to compete with each other, and we think that's how it goes from one to the other, okay, through a computation. Um, so I'm going to summarize this part of the talk with a movie here, an animation that was done by Said Sanuga, a guy who's uh, in the company, uh, Salscape. In, uh, in, uh, in New York. Um, I'm going to show you uh, an animation really summarizing everything we know about pivot biogenesis. Um, so we have here uh, the outer membrane, you have our structure, you recognize the internal domain of the usher, the plug, the better bound, the two C-terminal domains, and then you have the chaperone subunit complex, you can see uh, one of the, 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 the tip of one of the domains uh, appearing here. So <coughs> what you're going to see here is uh, the chaperone subunit complex, the next in assembly, will come in, bind to the internal domain. You will see the internal extension of that subunit will be in white. Okay? You will see it inserting into this P5 pocket. You're going to see the transfer reaction, uh, everything that we, uh, we know about uh, the bound genesis. So here we are. We're equipment to the internal domain. You can see the white bit inserting here, and then transfer to uh, through computation binding to the C terminal domain. So uh, binding reaction, refractory reaction uh, transfer. Now we're going to look at uh, the reaction of thermostatic exchange. You can see the P5 pocket here, the P5 residue, it inserts in, and then that uh, triggers the zipping reaction leading to the zip out of the strand of the chaperone that dissociates. Now we're going to zoom out. So things going to just uh, be, uh, uh, the, the, the pill is going to grow through successive addition of uh, uh, and then you see this formation of this quaternary structure. I told you there's a spiral, uh, superhelical super architecture of the pillars that forms at the exit of, of the, of the pillars as the pillars grows out of the usher. And we think this is what pulls subjects out. As a, the, the polymer is formed, it's pulled down by, by the, the coming out. Now, termination occurs through a reaction of this subunit here in red that obviously can react because there's a P5 pocket here in the subunit inside. However, the, the, the termination subunit has no P5 pocket. That means that any chaperone subunit complex is uh, recruited at the uh, system level to be able to react, and that's how termination occurs. Okay, so this is uh, one aspect, uh, mostly the structural aspect of what we've done. Um, as you can imagine, and being a biophysicist, um, this, this uh, type of uh, 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 assay that I just showed you, which are the assay, the usher mediated uh, pillars in uh, subunit incorporation, right? What we are doing here is that we are uh, taking a chapel subunit complex down to the usher, and then we react the next subunit in assembly, this next subunit being fluorescently labeled. So we can follow the reaction here, we can uh, do the, the kinetics, and we can derive rate constants. Okay, this is, again, it's the only membrane system where you can do this. So quite a, quite, quite a fortune to be able to do that kind of thing. So what you can do is that you can take your tannery complex of this uh, usher down to the first chapel of the complex. You can uh, 
uh, uh, uh, add the next uh, subunit, uh, for instance, the label, you can call it the action, and then to, 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 to the complex that's been formed, you can add uh, or, or you can purify another complex here and then react the next, next subunit. So what you can do here is react subunits one by one and follow them constantly and determine the rate constant of each of the reactions. And um, so this is what we came up with because obviously you can react the wrong subunit, you can react instead of reacting the second to the first, you can react the third to the first or whatever, the, the, the first or the second, you can do all sorts of permutations that allows you to monitor correct incorporation versus incorrect incorporations. And that will uh, lead, lead you to, to a, a model which I'm not going to uh, expand upon because I don't have that much time, but you can have, uh, you can uh, generate here a, a, a quite rigorous model, uh, a mathematical model for uh, incorporation at least of those uh, three subunits here, but you can also do it with the, with the, 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 long, the, the long polymer one. Um, and this is the kind of, uh, of curve that you can get from your mathematical, mathematical model. Obviously, you have to assume the kind of concentration you might have in the periplasm to determine which outcome, okay? And um, so, for instance, if you, uh, if you um, uh, uh, hypothesize that this uh, subunit here concentration is the same as this subunit concentration here. You can see the outcomes are rather vague. And you can either have incorporation of, uh, of F first, G first, while uh, if you uh, now change the concentration to 10 times more of F compared to G, you can get here, for instance, an outcome which is exactly the natural outcome, indicating that in the pair plasma, the concentration of this subunit, which is second here, is about 10 times less than the concentration of this one. So you can make inferences like that in completely mathematically modeled the system. Now, um, what we uh, did next is that we uh, took this complex, and as I told you, you can, uh, you can add uh, as many subunits you want. Uh, it turned out that by adding two more, so from this green one, we added the orange one and the red one here, we got a ternary complex, which I'm going to show you here. And that crystallizes when we'll be able to, 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 to solve that structure. So I'm going to spend uh, two or three minutes to show you this structure. So this is now a pentameric complex, you will sort of take it to another level of complexity. Um, and um, obviously, you know, this structure confirms that if you recruit another subunit here to the end term of the main, you can undergo the understanding of change, it's boundaries, the positions, everything together, the P5 pocket in front of the P5, uh, the cavity in front of the P5 pocket, you can have a change reaction. It's all confirmed through the structure, certainly. But we obviously learned uh, additional things. First, we learned that, you see, if you compare now um, the, um, oops, sorry. If you compare this structure to this one, you look only at the green subunit, okay? You see the green subunit here, the two domains here are aligned, okay? Now, once this subunit here is now bound to another subunit, so it has undergone the redundant complementation, it is now out of the, uh, the bound. You see it has undergone a massive conformation change. The superposition is shown here. You can see it was straight before uh, before, uh, when it was on this side of the membrane, now it uh, makes almost a 90 degree angle when it is outside. And we think that is important because uh, this conformation change here at the exit of the uh, of, of, of transport um, uh, prevents the pillars from backtracking. So we think that's a series of conformation changes. Each time the subunit comes out, there's a series of conformation changes that prevents backtracking. Uh, uh, of, of the pillars uh, back inside the periplasm. So that's how the pillars is, is, is pulled and there's a, uh, is pulled out. Now we have other things which are uh, interesting. Again, those are the comparisons that never been, not never, never, no one has been able to do before because we didn't have those sorts of, those structures of, for any transporters. So for instance, you have you see between the, 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 pale green, the pale green and the dark green. So the dark green, as I told you, is the subunit before it exits. And the light green is after it exits. So you can compare those two things. And you can see that the subunit, when it goes through the pore, undergoes contraction. 
So you have a grazing of the structure that allows compression of the, of the protein as it goes through the pore. Um, now another uh, interesting feature is that you see all subunits that you're seeing uh, uh, in, in these structures that we've seen. When they are inside the bound, they are right at the center of the bound. How come they are right at the center? Well, you could see, you know, it makes sense that it should be right at the middle because you, then you, you prevent, you, you minimize friction. So it should be at the, at the at least theoretically, you would imagine these uh, subunits as they go through the pore being right at the center of the pore. And indeed, you know, we've done so, this is uh, some work with Dave Baker at uh, the University of Washington, in Seattle, where what he did is that he takes that structure here and, that pull, and, and start pulling laterally and look at force fields, okay, at uh, forces. And so if you, if you pull laterally any of the subunits inside, you can see that there's a strong gradient that, that pull back subunits right at the center. So somehow there are forces uh, that, 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 uh, uh, that, that position subunits absolutely right at the center of the pole. And what he discovered, what David Baker and his postdoc here in Proko discovered, is that, so what they did is that they, 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 they have the pole and then they, they run a window, uh, about 60 degree window, that they rotate around the pole, okay? And at each position, so they do that every five to 10 degrees, and at every position, they, they compute the free energy of binding between the subunit and the part of the pole that is interacting with the, with the subunit. And what they found, so you just rotate the whole thing, the sector window, 360 degrees, and they found that there are two uh, uh, maxima here, as you can see uh, in green here, two maxima here, corresponding to, uh, which are uh, distance by 180 degrees. What it means is that whatever uh, free energy of binding you have here between that part of the subunit and the ultra, uh, you have exactly the same free energy of binding on this side. If you look at this side, you have the same on this side. You have diametrically opposed binding site within that pole. And so nature designed this, uh, this pole so that opposing diametrically opposed forces are exerted against the molecule that is being transported. So it's very, again, I think quite an extraordinary result. Now the other extraordinary result is the, the one I'm going to show you now. So what David Becker did is that he took the subunit here and then positioned it as, as you can see it here. And then what he does is that he, 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 um, he uh, rotates it 360 degrees, but every five degrees he computes free energy. And then once he's done with that, he moved it one electron inside the pole and does the same. One electron, 360 degrees. One electron, 360 degrees. Okay? Until it comes out, as you can see here. As you can see here. So this is the beginning process at the end of the process. And what he discovered here is something, again, which I think is quite fantastic. Is that there's an energy gradient. So if you look at this inside of the pole, you're not going to see rails, for instance, right? The, 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 the subunit, we know, uh, rotates inside because you have this transfer reaction from the internal and the major center. So that subunit is going to come out rotating. But if you look at what guides that subunit through the spore, there's no steric shape. There's no uh, particular gradient of, um, of, um, uh, of electrostatics. But if you compute free energy, this is what you see. So having a global free energy calculation, taking into account your hydrophobicity, polar, electrostatics, all the things that Rosetta, you know, David Becker would be a better uh, Rosetta. Um, if you compute the free energy of binding, you will find this energy time here, in which each subunit, through which each subunit has to go. Okay? And so this is a spiral because, uh, remember, this is the Usher uh, being like a map of, uh, of the globe, right? It's just put, it put into the, the screen, into the, enrolled to the screen. Um, so what you have is that within the Usher, if you have this spiral here, free energy spiral, in which to, that, that, that the subunit is obligated to follow. Okay? And that, uh, that particular uh, uh, feature of this energy track is such that it will exactly allow the, sub, the subunit to rotate 120 degrees uh, 
and translate 53 degrees, which is exactly what it takes to go from the internal domain to the internal domain. So you have this, you know, uh, evolutionary uh, magic here, you know, with billions of years, millions of years of evolution that just has maximized this transporter to do exactly what it's meant to do. Um, so I don't know, uh, I probably should stop here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to show you those things which I think are quite interesting, which are, you know, antibiotics problem. You know. So we are designing antibiotics against this uh, system because we think it's a more clever way of designing antibiotics and just uh, designing things that kill bacteria. Um, and, and we have a few promising things uh, which target uh, the, the five pocket and also the interaction with each other with certain complexes and the internal. So I'm just going to go through the, uh, through the um, acknowledgement slide. Um, and uh, so, uh, just, you know, obviously this has been a long time we've been at it, so as you can see there's quite a few people involved. But the, the, the latest um, uh, people involved were uh, Gilles Fan, uh, who did the DCH structure, Sebastian Geibel, who did the CDCHGF structure, and then uh, William Allen, who did all the skin in work. We did the drug design with David Selwood and Hunkin, and also Moon uh, Junior, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you for giving us an absolute, um, very insightful talk into a very uh, complicated, very um, fascinating system.